What you're seeing right here is the cytoplasm of a neuron's axon terminal at the level of the spinal cord. Now we know that when this neuron is depolarized, at the axon terminal there's calcium influx through voltage-gated calcium channels as you see right here. And that leads to a huge increase in the axoplasmic calcium concentration at the axon terminal. Now this calcium is going to have many effects, but the most important is that it triggers exocytosis of relevant neurotransmitters. The two that are important here are glutamate and substance P. So the calcium here will trigger the exocytosis of this amino acid glutamate. The vesicle will fuse with the membrane and then dump all that glutamate out on the other side into the synapse. And we know that glutamate is the primary excitatory neurotransmitter, so it will then excite the next neuron in the sequence. Additionally, calcium can come over here and trigger the exocytosis of this peptide called substance P. And so substance P binds to nociceptors and triggers the perception of pain. You could think of the P in substance P for pain. If you look up at the top here, we have a voltage-gated potassium channel, but right now it's inhibited and doing nothing. Over here on the left is the GABA B receptor and its associated G protein on the cytoplasmic side of the receptor. But again, this complex right now is doing virtually nothing while the axon terminal is depolarized. But let's suppose we throw in a GABA B receptor agonist, such as baclofen. Here's the chemical structure of baclofen. Uh, this is a drug that's used in the treatment of spasticity. So this GABA B receptor agonist is going to be able to bind to the GABA B receptor, and it's going to trigger conformational changes in this protein. Those conformational changes are going to allow this G protein inhibitory subunit to dissociate. G proteins have three subunits, alpha, beta, and gamma. The alpha subunit is excitatory, whereas the conglomerate of beta and gamma is the inhibitory subunit. And so once baclofen binds to this receptor, the inhibitory subunit is allowed to dissociate. Now, there are many GABA-B receptors, so there are many inhibitory subunits. And these inhibitory subunits bind to a number of proteins here, but the two relevant ones are these voltage-gated channels. First, this inhibitory subunit is going to bind to the voltage-gated calcium channel and inhibit it. That's going to prevent calcium from influxing into the axoplasm right here. Additionally, this inhibitory subunit binds to these voltage-gated potassium channels, and technically here it activates them, which facilitates potassium efflux out of the cell. Now, one thing just to be clear about. These GABA-B receptors are distributed all over the neuron. They exist on the axon terminal, they exist on the soma, and on the dendrites. When we consider the voltage-gated calcium channels, we're considering those at the axon terminal, although they do exist on the soma and the dendrites. And we consider them at the axon terminal because that inhibition of calcium influx is inhibiting exocytosis of these neurotransmitters. Whereas when we consider the voltage-gated potassium channels, those are going to be at the level of the soma and the dendrites. And so by stimulating these and facilitating potassium efflux, we're actually hyperpolarizing the entire neuron. So for voltage-gated potassium channels, hyperpolarize the entire neuron by inhibiting voltage-gated calcium channels, inhibiting exocytosis. And so we're having a dual additive effect when we use baclofen. And so overall, this large efflux of potassium, which hypopolarizes the entire neuron, and inhibiting calcium influx, this overall inhibits exocytosis of vesicles containing glutamate, which we said was the central nervous system excitatory neurotransmitter. And it inhibits the exocytosis of substance P. This diagram right here is the most common way that people picture the connections between upper and lower motor neurons. Up here at the top, we would have the brain, more specifically the motor parts of the cerebral cortex. And from there, we have axons of upper motor neurons that descend downward from the cortex through the brainstem down to the spinal cord, where they at some point synapse with lower motor neurons, which then go out to innervate skeletal muscle. And so if you want to contract this particular skeletal muscle, you have to have a motor program in the brain, which activates the upper motor neuron, which then activates the lower motor neuron, which then causes the muscle to contract. However, when you want to think about spasticity, this model is insufficient. So let's add some things to it. 
Now here, we still have this upper motor neuron that's coming from the brain, right? And there are still components of it that are excitatory in the sense that they are activating this lower motor neuron, causing this muscle to contract. However, if we look here, there are other branches coming off of this tract right here that go to inhibitory interneurons, and they activate these inhibitory interneurons. Now, since this interneuron is inhibitory, if it's activated, it then in turn inhibits the lower motor neuron. So you kind of have this tug of war here on this lower motor neuron. You have some fibers that are exciting it, and there are some that are inhibiting it. Now, if you think about this, if there's more excitation on this lower motor neuron than there is inhibition, then the muscle will be in a state of contraction, right? And if there's more inhibition, on this lower motor neuron then there is excitation, then the muscle will not be contracted, it will be more relaxed. Now one thing that's really interesting here is that these lower motor neurons are actually by default in a state of inhibition, meaning the muscle is going to be relaxed. And that's because overall there's more inhibition on the lower motor neuron then there is excitation. And so the way that you get this muscle to contract is you have to release the inhibition on the lower motor neuron. That's called disinhibition, and it's a major mechanism within the central nervous system. If you want to get a neuron excited, you have to release the inhibition, and it's kind of like two negatives make a positive. So that's the first important point here, is that in order to activate the lower motor neuron, you have to have disinhibition. You have to release the inhibition. Now, a second very important point here is that overall, there is more inhibition on this lower motor neuron than there is excitation. And you say, well, how can that be? How can there be more inhibition? All I see are these little inner neurons. How can these possibly produce more inhibition than there is excitation? And the answer is, there are many other descending inhibitory tracts that I do not have drawn here that come down from the brain, and their job, in part, is to inhibit the lower motor neurons. I don't have them drawn here because it would get very convoluted, but in a few slides, we're gonna look at a few of the important ones. But understand, there are other inhibitory tracks that are coming down to inhibit this lower motor neuron. So, there's more inhibition than there is excitation. And then we have important concept number three, and that is of the stretch reflex. Remember that embedded within these muscle fibers, we have muscle spindles. These are receptors that detect stretch of a muscle. If this muscle stretches, the muscle spindles activate. And that causes this 1A afferent neuron to activate. And when it activates, it goes back to the spinal cord and activates this lower motor neuron. What that means is if you provide a quick stretch to this muscle, then this loop will cause the muscle to contract. And we already know about that. This is like the patella reflex. When you go to the doctor's office or the PT's office and they take a reflex hammer and whack your patellar tendon, that hitting of the patellar tendon stretches the quad muscle. It's a quick stretch of it causing a little bit of knee extension. That's your knee jerk, right? That is a stretch reflex. Now, let's suppose that we have a cerebral infarct, something like a stroke that damages these upper motor neurons. Now these upper motor neurons are gone. And so remember, most of these are inhibitory. So if we're losing upper motor neurons, we are losing inhibition on the lower motor neuron. This is like an extreme form of disinhibition. Now we have extreme activation of the lower motor neuron, and this leads to higher resting tone of a muscle. This is what leads to the hypertonus associated with upper motor neuron lesions. Now, other than the higher resting tone of muscles, there's another problem here that has to do with the stretch reflex. Remember, we've already lost inhibition in this lower motor neuron. So let's suppose we give a quick stretch to this muscle. Well, the muscle spindles are still gonna sense that, and they're going to relay this information through this loop to activate the lower motor neuron. Well, there's no inhibition here already. So if we give a quick stretch and we're further activating this lower motor neuron, we're gonna get a large contraction of this muscle. This is an exaggerated stretch reflex, and this is known as spasticity. So spasticity involves this muscle stretch reflex loop right here in the absence of descending inhibitory input to the lower motor neuron. So some people will define spasticity as velocity-dependent hypertonus because you have to stretch the muscle in order to see the tone develop. 
But again, the reason that you have to stretch the muscle is because it involves this reflex loop right here. Now backtracking a little bit, remember I keep talking about this other descending inhibitory input, right? Well, here it is over here. So if you look here, here's our stretch reflex circuitry. If we activate the stretch reflex circuitry, we get a stretch reflex, which makes sense, right? And there are several things controlling that circuitry. And those are these nuclei right here. The first is the ventromedial bulbar reticular formation. When this is activated, it will inhibit the stretch reflex by virtue of the dorsal reticulospinal tract. Then we have the dorsal reticular formation. When this is activated, it will actually activate the stretch reflex circuitry by virtue of the medial reticulospinal tract. And then here we have the vestibular nuclei, which when activated, will also activate the stretch reflex circuitry by virtue of the vestibulospinal tract. Now here's a question for you. If this is all you had to go off of right here and you wanted to activate the stretch reflex, which of these three nuclei would have to be activated? Well, it would have to be the vestibular nuclei and dorsal reticular formation, right? Because if they're activated, they in turn activate the stretch reflex. And you would need this over here, the ventromedial bulbar reticular formation, to be inhibited. But as we know, the central nervous system doesn't function that way. It functions by sending inhibitory input overall. So what the premotor cortex actually does by default is it actually does the opposite. It actually inhibits the dorsal reticular formation. It actually inhibits the vestibular nuclei, and then it stimulates the ventromedial bulbar reticular formation. And so that allows the ventromedial bulbar reticular formation to inhibit the stretch reflex, and it prevents the vestibular nuclei and dorsal reticular formation from activating the stretch reflex. The net effect is that the stretch reflex is inhibited. Okay, or at least it's kept at a minimum. But what happens when we have an upper motor neuron lesion? These three descending inputs up here from the premotor cortex are gone. So what happens? The premotor cortex can no longer activate the ventromedial bulbar reticular formation, and so now you have less inhibition on the stretch reflex. It can no longer inhibit the vestibular nuclei and dorsal reticular formation, and so now you have excessive activation of the stretch reflex. The net effect is you have too much stretch reflex or an exaggerated stretch reflex. And so overall, this inhibitory input from the brain is gone. This leads to spasticity, and that leads us to talking about baclofen. Remember, that's our major antispasticity agent. If we've wiped out the upper motor neurons up here, the only hope we have for reducing spasticity is to either have an effect on this 1A afferent sensory neuron right here, or to have an effect directly on the lower motor neuron. That's actually what baclofen does. Remember, baclofen, through virtue of the GABA B receptor, inhibits these neurons. It's able to inhibit the 1A afferent neuron, and it's actually also able to, not shown here, inhibit the lower motor neuron directly. So if you inhibit the lower motor neuron directly, then there's less activation of the muscle, right? But more importantly, if you inhibit this 1A afferent neuron, you're inhibiting this part of the reflex loop. So that way, if you were to provide a quick stretch of the muscle, the degree of spasticity should be less than if you weren't taking the baclofen at all. So baclofen won't necessarily get rid of the spasticity, but it may take someone who was originally a three on the modified Ashworth scale and reduce their score to a two or a one plus, which can have major benefits for function and ADLs. One more note here on spasticity. Whenever somebody has an upper motor neuron lesion, especially a stroke or cerebral palsy, you'll often see them postured with their upper extremity here in what's called a flexion synergy. Now there is an extension synergy, but the flexor synergy is much more common. One good theory might be that the cerebral insult only affects the flexors and doesn't affect the extensors. Therefore, you only have spasticity in the flexors and thus a flexor synergy. That was certainly my thought at first, but that's actually not correct. So the cerebral insult does affect both the flexors and the extensors. The difference lies in the fact that the spasticity of the flexors produces more force 
than the spasticity of the extensors overall. And so the flexors overpower the extensors. And so therefore, you have individuals who posture their upper extremity in this common flexor synergy. So hopefully this video on spasticity makes sense, and now you have a grasp of why lesions of the upper motor neurons lead to an exaggerated stretch reflex and higher tone in muscles. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.